Hello and welcome back to the Consistory of the Cog YouTube channel. I'm your host of this video, Reverend Jake Zabel, the St. John's Evangelical Lutheran Church located in Dolby, Queensland, Australia. Today we're going to be continuing through our What It Means to Be a Lutheran lecture series and we're going to be wrapping up part two of the Small Court Articles. We still have part three to go, but we're going to be wrapping up by looking at the fourth article of part two on the Office of the Pope. Last week we looked at Luther's point that the Pope is a human institution. In this video, we're going to look at the Pope is Antichrist because Luther in this small cold article says that the Pope truly is the Antichrist and people probably know that the Lutheran position is that the Pope is the Antichrist and so let's look at that. Um, for those interested, I have done numerous videos on this topic on this very channel. Um, discussing the Pope is the Antichrist, um, discussing what Scripture says, what the Confessions say, what the Lutheran, what the Roman Catholic Church teaches about the office of the Pope, um, why Muhammad is not the Antichrist, why we teach the Antichrist is an office and not an individual, and I think I have a few others out there as well. So I, I, I've done numerous videos on this topic. And so basically, I'm going to go through a lot of that again in this video, but if there's probably, I'm not going to get onto everything in this video. So if you want to learn more about this topic of the Pope as Antichrist, you can check out the other videos on this topic. But let's begin by saying, what does Scripture say about the Antichrist? Now, the Antichrist is not someone who is opposite to Christ, it's someone who places himself in opposition to Christ, in the place of Christ. The actual word anti doesn't mean opposite, it means to be in the place of something, instead of something. Which is why I think it then has uh, over years developed into like the opposite, like to mean the opposite, because if something is in the stead of something, you've got it instead of it, so it's this or it's that. So I think that's how the development of anti is opposite. I, I'm not a language expert, but the term Antichrist, at least in the Greek here, means someone who places themselves in the place of Christ, as a replacement for Christ. And so, Matthew in Matthew 28, 5, and also St. John in 2 John 1, 7, said that many will come claiming to be the Christ, and such people are a deceiver and an Antichrist, one who puts himself in place of Christ, a false Christ. Uh, 2 John 2.18 also speaks of many antichrists going into the world. Pretty much anyone who's a false teacher is an antichrist. However, these texts speak of many antichrists, yet we get two verses, 1 John 2.18, which speaks of the antichrist coming, and 1 John 4.3, which states that the antichrist was coming and is now already in the world. So, like I said, any false teacher is an antichrist. And so if you really want to look at this, be like antichrist with a lowercase a. But there is also a scripture that talks about a specific antichrist with a capital A. And this figure is also known by other names in scripture. Particularly in 2 Thessalonians, he's known as the man of lawlessness and the son of perdition. Now, despite the popular opinion, the term antichrist is never mentioned in the book of Revelation. Uh, instead, there is a figure in the book of Revelation uh, who pops up in Revelation 16, 13, 19, 20, and 2010, who is called the false prophet. And in Revelations 13, 11, 18, this false prophet is also identified as the second beast, described as one who looks like the lamb, who has the appearance of a lamb, but the voice of a dragon. So in other words, he looks like Christ, but speaks like the devil. That, again, sounds like a false Christ, an antichrist. Um, also, in the Book of Concord, Melanchthon attributes the King of the North in the end of Daniel 11 with being the antichrist. Now, we are going to discuss that in further detail towards the end of this study, so we will discuss that more. Uh, also, in some of Luther's private writings, he also identified the little horn on the fourth beast in the seventh chapter of the book of Daniel to also be the Antichrist. Um, 
Although in other times, Luther has also attributed that little horn to other people, and when it comes to that, the Lutherans, like as Lutheran theologians, like those after Luther, some say that that little horn is the Antichrist, others would identify it with somebody else. Um, this would be something that we'll probably discuss more, but basically, if you look at the Lutheran confessions, basically, we we demand a subscription to the interpretation of Second Thessalonians, but when it comes to Revelation and the book of Daniel, there are a little bit more open questions. Uh, so, for the sake of this video, I'm going to go through these uh, these interpretations from the book of Daniel and Revelation, but just know that there has been alternative interpretations put forth by other Lutherans, theologians, even as we'll even discuss, even Luther himself has put forth multiple different interpretations on Daniel 7. Um, just look at his writings all over his lifetime. But what we do seem to find in these different Bible passages is at least six marks of the Antichrist. Now, the first mark is that the Antichrist is going to be someone from within the church. Um, 2 Thessalonians 2.4 says that the man of lawlessness will take his seat in the temple of God. It's someone coming from within the church. Uh, secondly, 2 Thessalonians also mentions that not only is he seated in the temple of God, but he places himself above God and all that is worshipped and shows himself to be God. Thus, the man of lawlessness not only is in the church, but he makes himself the head of the church, usurping that position from Christ. The third thing, the third mark is from 2 Thessalonians 2, 9-10, that the man of lawlessness will perform many signs and wonders uh, that are found a, founded on the work and power of Satan, and that he will cause a wicked deception, which will cause many to perish. Uh, we also see in like Matthew 24, 24, and Mark 13, 22, that false prophets and false Christ will come leading people astray with signs and wonders. That refers to more than just the Antichrist. Uh, but if we also look at the false prophet, the second beast in the book of Revelation, uh, Revelation 13.13 13 says that he will do great wonders and deceive the world through miracles. Uh, in Revelation 19.20 it also says that this false prophet will deceive many through signs. Uh, the fourth mark, and this is one that is actually identified in the Book of Concord, Daniel 11.38, uh, as Melanchthon states that the Antichrist will establish new man-made traditions that will be made absolutely necessary for salvation. And this comes from Daniel 11, 38, in which the King of the North establishes new mandate rites and ceremonies that the fathers did not know, but that will people will have to now submit to in order to be saved. Uh, we also could add to this 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 3, in which Paul mentions that in the latter times, many will depart from the faith and they'll pursue the doctrines of demons, forbidding marriage and commanding people to abstain from certain foods. Uh, fifthly, the scripture would teach that the Antichrist is not just a spiritual leader. Well, actually, sorry. The fifthly, the scriptures would teach that the Antichrist is a spiritual leader. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, he will take his place in the church or the you know the temple of God. Uh, also, if we look at the second beast in the book of Revelation, as I said, he has the appearance of the lamb and the voice of the devil. He looks like Christ but speaks like the devil. Uh, and sixthly, the Antichrist will not only be a spiritual leader but a political leader. Uh, in Daniel 11, he is symbolized by the king of the north, but also in Daniel 7, the little horn is ruling over the fourth beast. And so he'd be a political leader. Particularly, the fourth beast is meant to be interpreted as the Roman Empire, which would mean that the little horn would have to be the ruler over the Roman Empire. And so we're going to then discuss whether or not the Roman Pope fits the six biblical marks of identifying the Antichrist. And, of course, if we go to part Mark 1, he's a member of the church, and Mark 5, he's the head of the church. Well, there we go. That's clearly 
something that the Pope teaches. Not only is the Pope a member of the Church, he claims to be the head of the Church. He is the universal bishop, the head of all Christendom. Now, it is also for this reason for why we don't teach as Lutherans that Muhammad is the Antichrist. There were some times when Luther thought that Muhammad may have been the Antichrist, but later we rejected that view because, as Luther will say, the Bible is clear that the Pope, the Pope, the Bible is clear that the Antichrist will emerge from within the church and Muhammad is outside the church. So Muhammad can't be the Antichrist. He may be a Antichrist, but not the Antichrist. Now regarding point two, that the Antichrist would exalt himself above God and show himself to be God. Well, we have in the paper, uh, the Dictus Pepe, written by Pope Gregory the Seventh in 1075 AD, that he declared that the Pope alone could decide scripture and that nobody could judge him and any decree made by the Pope could only be retracted by the Pope. Uh, also, there is the Unum Sanctum from 1302, written by Pope Boniface the Eighth, in which he decreed that the Church has one head, uh, Christ and the Pope, and for those who can count, Christ, Pope, that equals two. Uh, but no, Rome says there is one head, Christ and Pope, which means the Pope is identified with Christ. Uh, also, the Unum Sanctum actually decrees that salvation is necessary, absolute, sorry, let me rephrase that sentence. In order to have salvation, it's absolutely necessary that you submit to the Roman Pope. This was also reaffirmed at Vatican I in 1870, in which not only was the doctrine of papal, papal infallibility established, but it was affirmed that no one could be saved unless they accepted and taught that the Pope was the head of the church by divine right, and that one could not be considered a member of the Church of Christ unless they were in fellowship with the Roman Pope. So the Pope not only exalts himself to the level of Christ, even nearly above Christ, because as Luther will point out in the Small Cold Articles, the Pope says that even those Greek Christians and the Protestants, even if they have faith in Christ, cannot be saved unless they submit to the Pope. This is why Luther says in Article 4 of the Small Court Articles Part 2 that, as he cites 2 Thessalonians 2 4, that the Pope truly is the end times Antichrist, who has raised himself over and set himself against Christ because the Pope will not let any Christian be saved without his authority. Luther adds that not even the Turks, the Muslims, or the Tatars, the Mongolians, despite being the enemies of the church, despite being enemies of Christ, never did such a thing. See, as I said, from time to time, Luther did consider whether Muhammad might be the Antichrist. But as Luther says here in the Small Court Articles, Muhammad isn't the Antichrist. He might be an enemy of the church, but... Even then, he does not have the audacity to assert that salvation is necessity through submission to him. Like, you even think of the Islamic creed. Allah is one, his Quran is his official word, and Muhammad is his prophet, something along those lines. Like, Islam points to Allah. Like, Muhammad never says you have to submit to me to be saved. He says you have to submit to Allah to be saved. So as Luther says, Muhammad's not the Antichrist because he doesn't even have the audacity to put himself above God. The Pope does. Um, now we get to our um, the, the next mark, which is that the Pope or the Antichrist would lead people astray through signs and wonders. Now, people might be going, well, the Pope's not doing signs and wonders. Um, even if the Pope himself isn't doing them, we can also just look at the entire cult of saints, in which there are the miracles, the miracles that are attributed to the saints, which have then led to people offering prayers to and venerating these saints. 
uh, Luther himself in the second article of part two of the small court articles says that the invocation of saints is one of the abuses of the Antichrist. Uh, the next mark is that the Antichrist would implement new rights and man-made laws that would he would insist would be absolutely necessary for salvation. I mean, Melanchthon addresses this multiple times throughout the, like, especially the apology of the Augsburg Confession when he discusses things like the Roman Catholics' distinctions in foods and the Roman Catholics' prohibition on uh, marriage of priests. But particularly, Melanchthon focuses in on this in Article 15 of the Apology, when he talks about human traditions, where Melanchthon quotes Daniel 11.38 and said that this indicates that new religious rights will be the form and constitution of the kingdom of the Antichrist and that the papacy defends its human rights as justifying before God. And Melanchthon elsewhere, as I said, he will quote 1 Timothy 4 about the doctrine of demons when referring to the Catholics' prohibition on marriage for priests and on their distinction for foods. Uh, Melanchthon makes this connection even more blunt in the treatise on the power and primacy of the Pope where he says that the papacy's prohibitions on marriage is the doctrine of demons and the doctrine of the Antichrist. Uh, likewise, Martin Luther also, in part three of the Small Court Articles, Article 11, when he talks about priestly marriage, says that the papacy's prohibition on priestly marriage is of the Antichrist. And so we now come to the last mark, which is the Antichrist as a political head. Now, already in the Unum Sanctum, Pope Boniface VIII declared that when Jesus said to the apostles that their two swords were enough, that this was apparently Jesus giving Peter permission to wield the sword of both church and state. Um, but already since the year 754 AD, the Pope had been the de facto king of the Papal States. Well, not really de facto, official. He was the king of the Papal States. Um, but even that, um, as some scholars will say, the foundation for the Papal States and the Pope ruling over like Vatican City goes all the way back to uh, the late 500s with Pope Gregory the First, Pope Gregory the Great, as he is often called. Um, but I mean, we'll take a brief look at this 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 state of the Papal States now from 754 to. 1870, the Pope ruled over an area known as the Papal States. Now, there is a little bit of debate over whether the Pope ruled over these areas from 1817 to 1929. Um, technically, those areas had been annexed by the Kingdom of Italy, though the Roman Pope did not... he didn't relinquish his claim on those lands, and this was known as the Roman Question, in which the Pope continued to claim those lands, and even though he wasn't able to actively rule over those lands, he still actively ruled over the territory of Vatican City. And then in the year 1929, with the Lateran Treaty, the Pope relinquished his claims on those other Papal States in order for Vatican City to be officially recognised as an independent nation-state. And so since then, the Pope has continued to rule as the head of the remaining Papal States. And the Papal States are essentially the succession to the old Roman Empire. And this becomes important because there are some Lutheran theologians who see the Papal States as the fulfillment of the prophecy of Daniel 7. So in Daniel 7 there are four beasts and they're identified with being four empires. And historically those empires ever since the early church have been identified as uh, Babylon, Persia, Alexander's Empire, and the Roman Empire. And this fourth beast, the Roman Empire, on its heads pop up ten horns. And then three of those horns get plucked up and a little horn emerges to rule over all the horns. And 
Some scholars see this as being fulfilled in the history of the establishment of the Papal States. So after Rome fell in 476 AD, the territories that used to make up the Roman Empire were divided between ten different um, Germanic barbarian kingdoms. And according to Niccolo Machiavellian in his 1532 History of Florence, this was divided between ten different kingdoms. The kingdoms of the Vandals, the Visigoths, the Ostrogoths, the Franks, the Almanians, the Burgundians, the Anglo-Saxons, the Phrygians, the Subians, and the Hurii. Uh, officially, the Hurii being led by, by Odassa, Ar the, the guy, the barbarian king that actually conquered the Roman Empire and deposed the last Roman Pope and took over control of Rome itself. Now, where then do the plucking up of these three horns come in? Well, some people have suggested that there were three Germanic tribes that were deposed under the influence of the Roman Pope. Uh, the first being the Curiae. So, in the year 489 AD, the Eastern Roman Emperor Zeno and Pope Felix III prompted the Ostrogoth king, uh, Theodocrit, Theodocrit, uh, to invade Rome and to depose of Odassia and the Hurii. And so in the year 493 AD, uh, the Ostrogoths managed to take control of Rome. And so the Hurii were removed. Uh, also in the year 533 AD, the new Eastern Emperor Justinian, along with the new Roman Pope John II, declared war on the Vandals, and after nine months of campaigning in the year 534 AD, the Vandals were also eradicated. Uh, then in the year 535 AD, the Eastern Empire uh, invaded, the, the, invaded Italy, and this began the Gothic Wars between the Eastern Empire and the Ostrogoths, and in the year 554 AD, after about nearly two decades of warring, the Ostrogoths were also destroyed and by the request of both Valigius, the prefecture of Italy was returned to Roman dominion. And so they established a central little Roman territory which was technically ruled over by the Eastern Roman Empire but was kind of administrated by the Pope. And basically from that point in time the that was under the control of the papacy until the year 751 where for a few years uh, the Lombards held the territory until the year 754 when Francus King Pepin the Short conquered the Lombards and handed over all the territory to Pope Stephen the Second. And this thus made the Pope essentially the successor to the Western Roman Empire. Now, as I said earlier, this is not something that the Lutherans demand a subscription to. There are some Lutherans who accept this interpretation of Daniel 7 and see these events as a fulfillment of the events of Daniel 7. But the Book of Concord does not demand a subscription to this. And in fact, not only Luther, but other Lutheran theologians have proposed numerous alternative interpretations. Uh, for example, Luther argued that he believed the Roman Empire had like ten provinces and that when Islam rose up, they conquered the provinces of Egypt, Asia Minor and Greece. And so Luther saw that as a fulfillment of this prophecy in Daniel 7. There are others who also suggest that it wasn't the Curiae, the Vandals and the Ostrogoths, but the Curiae, the Ostrogoths and the Lombards, who are the three horns plucked up. Because even though the Vandals were plucked up, they never ruled over Rome, whereas the Curiae, the Ostrogoths and the Lombards actually for, for a period of time controlled the city of Rome. And so others have interpreted maybe they're the three horns that get plucked up. Um, like I said, this is just one interpretation. There is no subscription to this in the Book of Concord. Um, what is subscribed to in the Book of Concord is the identification of the King of the North in Daniel 11 with the Pope. 
although that's going to require some further explanation and that helps because this further explanation also helps to explain why we Lutherans believe that the Antichrist is not an individual as in like one single person but the individual office of the papacy passed from individual to individual. Uh, and one of the main proof texts of this is from Daniel 11. For you see, in the book of Daniel, in chapter 11, there is this conflict between the king of the north and the king of the south. But most scholars, all the way back to the early church, have always taught that this is not referring to a single individual king waging war with a single individual king, but that this is a reference to the two different warring dynasties, the Seleucid dynasties that ruled over Persia in the north, and the Ptolemaic dynasties that ruled over Egypt in the south. And so the king of the north actually refers to a dynasty, not one individual king. Um, now, Luther himself also taught that in Daniel 11, when it talks about the abomination of desolation, that this was a reference to when Antiochus Epiphanes, the king of the north, who ruled over the Seleucids, defiled the temple of Jerusalem by turning it into a temple of Zeus. See 2 Maccabees 6.2. And that may make, make people wonder, well, hold on, if, if the king of the north is the Seleucids, and Luther even says that this is fulfilled by Antiochus Epiphanes, then how come Melanchthon in the Book of Concord says the king of the north is the Antichrist? And that happens to do with... The, the, how the text talks. See, in Daniel 11 verses 5 to 35, you have this conflict between the king of the north and the king of the south. Then when we get to verse 34, it ends by speaking of the end times and the appointed time, the time of the coming of the Messiah. And then verse 35 then says, then the king of the north will do da 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 da. Meaning that the king of the north mentioned in verse 35 is an end times king of the north. Not the Seleucids, not Antiochus Epiphanes, but one that will emerge at the end times. And another reinforcement for this is that in verse 35 it says the king of the north will establish himself as above all the other gods and that he will have him worshipped which is pretty much similar to what 2 Thessalonians 2.4 says the man of lawlessness will do. Uh, likewise, what is important here is that in Matthew 24 verses 15 to 16 and Luke 21 20 to 21, Jesus speaks of the abomination of desolation coming at the end times, that the temple of God will be defiled in the end times. And Luther says that this was then fulfilled by Antiochus Epiphanes in Daniel 11 as a symbol, a symbol or an archetype of the fulfillment of the abomination of desolation happening to the church. So in other words, Luther taught that, yes, what Antiochus Epiphanes did to the temple in Jerusalem was the abomination of desolation, and this was a symbolic archetype of how the Antichrist would bring about an abomination of desolation in the temple of God, which is when the man of lawlessness sets himself up in the temple of God as, a, a, you know, exalting himself above God. And so in the same way that Antiochus Epiphanes defiled the temple of Jerusalem, so too the Antichrist will defile the church, which Luther then believes was fulfilled in the Pope establishing himself as the universal head of the church. He brought about the abomination of desolation. And so what is important about all of this then is that, as I mentioned, the king of the north was not a single individual king. It was not one particular king. It was a dynasty of kings. Therefore, we apply that same logic to the Antichrist not being a single one-off individual, but being an office held by multiple individuals. Um, some of the other things that would also support this doctrine of the, the Antichrist being an office, not an individual, is that in 2 Thessalonians 2.7, Paul talks about 
the mystery of lawlessness being already at work. And then in verse 9, he speaks about the lawless one coming. Now, in the Greek, it uses the aris form of the verb. And the aris form is an interesting form because it's, it's not future sense as in like something that will happen. It's a future sense in the idea of something that has happened, is happening, and will continue to happen. Um, some of the best examples would be like baptism and marriage. You were baptized, but you still are baptized, and you're going to continue being in a state of baptism in the future. Uh, similarly, marriage. You were married on your wedding day, but you're still married today. And you're going to continue to be married until like your spouse um, parts, uh, like you know, dies. Um, and so the Aris form is like, look, he's come, he's still here, and he's going to continue to come. Uh, this also can be seen by the fact that the Antichrist is called the end times Antichrist. He's, he's said to come at the end times. And as Lutherans, we are millennialists. We don't believe in this 1,000 year millennial kingdom that's going to come. We believe that we are currently in the millennium and that the millennium started with the ascension. And the main proof text I believe that can support this is in Acts chapter 2 during Peter's Pentecost sermon when he quotes Joel 2, 28, 30 to th verse 32. Peter says that the events of Pentecost was a fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel. And Joel 2.28 says that this prophecy would take place in the last days, or the latter days. See, the latter days, the last days, the end times. We are now in that period now. And so, if the Antichrist is going to be present for the end times, he must be present now. And we actually get this in the epistles of John, where John says in 1 John 2.18, that the Antichrist will come at the last hour, and then he says, we are currently in the last hour. Also in 1 John 4, 3, he says that you have heard the Antichrist is coming and is already now in the world. Thus, John is saying, like what Paul says, he is here and he is going to keep coming. He is here now and he's going to come in the future. He's going to continue to keep coming. His coming is a continual coming. Uh, I mean, the fact then is that if he's there now in their days and he's going to continue to come throughout the whole period of the end times up until the present, then the Antichrist can't be a single individual unless he's somehow immortal and has lived for the last 2,000 years. In order for the Antichrist to be present for the whole end times, to be present back then and to be present now, it must be an office that is passed from individual to individual. And so from this, we can see that the Antichrist is not a single person, but is a single office. And so before we wrap up this video, I want to address one other problem that has emerged in Lutheran churches since the Reformation. Because there are some Lutherans out there that teach that the Pope is... Not not the Antichrist, but that the Pope is no longer the Antichrist. For example, the Lutheran Church of Australia says that the Pope is no longer the Antichrist, meaning that he used to be the Antichrist, but not anymore. That in the Reformation period, yeah, the Pope was the Antichrist, but now somebody else is the Antichrist. Uh, this is also the current teaching of the Missouri Synod, although not exactly the same. The Missouri Synod still says that the current Pope is the Antichrist, but they do say that there is the possibility that in the future it could change to be somebody else. Uh, and also in the 1800s, the premillennialist Lutherans such as August Carvel, and you probably get groups like this now, the, ch uh, the Church of the Lutheran Brethren, um, Carvel and them taught that there were actually two antichrists, the Pope and another individual figure that would pop up at the beginning of the thousand year kingdom of Christ. Now, these views are not only contrary to Holy Scripture, but to our Lutheran confessions. Firstly, John teaches us in his epistles that there may be numerous antichrists, 
for any false teacher is an antichrist, but there is specifically a antichrist. John draws this distinction between those who are antichrist and those who are antichrist at capital A. Now, as we mentioned, the antichrist capital A is not a single individual but a single office. But John makes this distinction but there is a difference between those false teachers and this particular false teacher. You know, this teacher is also known as the man of lawlessness. There are not men of lawlessness, there is one particular man of lawlessness which is the papal office. If the Antichrist could change from being the papal office to somebody else, then the Pope wouldn't be the Antichrist, he would just be an Antichrist, one among many. Um, therefore, John is clear that you can't have the Antichrist changing offices. He must stay put. And this is not only contrary to Scripture, but it is explicitly contrary to the Lutheran Confessions. Because Luther, in the Small Cold Articles, Part 2, Article 4, says that the Pope truly is the very end times Antichrist. He's not just a Antichrist, he is the Antichrist. I mean, Luther takes this further and says that the Pope, the Papal Office, is the fulfillment of 2 Thessalonians 2.4. He is the fulfillment of the man of lawlessness. So to say that somebody else could be the Pope is to be contrary to the Lutheran Confessions and say that he is not the fulfillment of 2 Thessalonians. Therefore, anybody who says that the Pope is not the Antichrist, or that the Antichrist could be somebody else, or that the Antichrist could change from the Pope to somebody else, they cannot rightfully call themselves a confessional Lutheran. I've been your host, Reverend Jake Zabel. Goodbye and God bless.